Hey, everybody. How's everyone doing? Sounds like it's been an eventful day. Yeah. Doing good over here. You guys want to do a quick, just a quick intro of each of yourselves, just name and basic information, kind of a 15 second elevator speech so that people can remind themselves of everyone. Okay. Great. If Matt, you want to start? And we can go clockwise. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Williams at SMP Global Commodity Insights. I am our primary analyst covering uh, the California cap and trade, as well as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which covers the U.S. power sector in the Northeast. Um, when that's not taking up all of my time, I uh, do a lot in the U.S. federal policy realm and state level policy and how those impact not only uh, those cap and trade markets that I talked about, but other uh, commodity markets that Commodity Insights cover, like your traditional power markets, oil and gas markets, that like. Great. And Jerry? Or Grant, you want to go? Nice to see you. Great to see you as well. Hi, I'm Grant Strem, Proton Technologies, sitting here in Canada in Calgary, and I'll be down in Houston next week for Sarah Week. And uh, I look forward to uh, having more discussions around carbon sequestration and uh, perhaps related hydrogen production. Laura, you're on mute. How about Michael? Hi, all. Um, nice to see everybody in this call. Yeah, I'm Michael Evans. I'm part of S&P Global Commodity Insights. Um, I work alongside Matt and uh, and cover uh, the carbon market uh, space, uh, really focusing on European and UK carbon markets, but also looking probably more kind of towards the um, towards the eastern regions as well. So covering the likes of the um, Asia Pacific markets of which they're developing at some substantive rates and also looking at the voluntary carbon market as well. So we offer quite a range of analytical products to, to clients of which I'm um, sort of author and researcher for, for a number of those. Um, I'm based in uh, London uh, out of our London office. Um, so yes, yeah, slightly darker background for me given it's a little bit later in our uh, our evening here. Great. And who's next? Who'd like to go? Jim Gadara here. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, I've had a long career in energy project finance uh, at uh, several banks, including Credit Agricole, where I was the manager of the project financing activities for almost 20 years. I have also been a professor of international energy project finance at Columbia University, which I continue to do, where I teach a course on energy project finance and have written on the topics and my presentation today was about the uh, the optimistic, the much improved prospects for financing uh, carbon capture and uh, and green and blue hydrogen following the uh, 2022 uh, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Great. Thank you. Next. We got everyone covered. Hi, I, I don't think I've quite gone and I, I apologize. I came in a little late. This is Carrie Fellers. Uh, I work as the director of business development for a company called PetroLearn. We do um, mostly subsurface assessments for geothermal carbon capture. We also ha have started in the last year, few years developing technology in that space. So my background is traditional hydrocarbons. I spent 15 years at Baker Hughes doing a variety of roles, doing market strategy, uh, business analysis, uh, a, a number of things there, and then hopped over to another smaller service company called Expro out of Aberdeen and spent several years there and then was invited to join the energy transition and delighted to be here with PetroLearn. So it's, it's great to meet all of you today. Nice to see you again, Carrie. Good to see you. All right. 
I think we've got everyone covered. I think it's um, exciting to have you all in one spot. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have to say about some of these questions. Um, I think a good spot to start is the, where do you guys see how far the geothermal space has come and the CCS space has come over the last three years? I think everyone knows it's come extremely far over the last decade, but I think there's been substantial um, value and substantial progress in the last few years. And what are some of the main points of progress that you guys have seen? And what are some pinpoints of progress that you hope to see in the next year? I would like to volunteer to go first. I, I don't mind. So I think very broadly, you see a lot more. Um, I've been invited to several government discussions on how does industry want to see policies come in that sort of encourage this to happen. So the government uh, engagement that I've seen in Canada, the US and elsewhere has, I think, ramped up very significantly, which will um, come through in, in new ways. In a very specific proton uh, related aspect in, in middle of, I guess it was Q2 2020, we started sequestering uh, CO2 as carbonate within our oil field, mostly in the bottom water zone. And in the next year, we hope to uh, add very significantly to what we're already doing in that regard by injecting um, high pH wastewater fluid that triggers reactions with the CO2 to make carbonate. Anyway, lots to come uh, this year and hopefully soon in the US as well in that, re in that regard. Grant, do you see that the Canadian and US government policy works well together or is it more of a race and competition between the two? of who gets there first? Or is there a way that you're starting to see that we're working well together to kind of collaborate, whether one does the storage and production or one does the transport versus the storage? What are you seeing in that? Well, there's there's been uh, examples where there's cross-border CO2 pipelines, for example, uh, from North Dakota to Saskatchewan uh, in relation to a large enhanced oil recovery project that uh, Whitecap Resources is doing in Saskatchewan. But so I think there's there's been some of that stuff already going for, for quite a while. But, um, you know, I think it's actually now more of a race. The Inflation Reduction Act has really uh, set the bar high in terms of uh, what what the incentives are. And so I, I know a lot of Canadian companies are, are looking at, at that sort of uh, framework, um, maybe wishing that Canada had as strong of incentives for carbon sequestration. And lastly, on the geothermal side too, in regards to the Canada and US side, as much as the IRA covers the storage capabilities and value asset proposition there, what about the power side of it? Is it, are you seeing more viability in these small powers, yeah, small scale or large scale industrial scale type power markets as a PPA? Uh, with respect to geothermal, there's not as much in Canada. There's a lot of, uh, more of the focus is on industrial heat capture. So taking organic rank in or Stirling engines or some sort of secondary capture system. But definitely there is some of it. So in most of Canada's energy production areas, it's, it's more of a, a background with sort of traditional oil and gas and the geothermal gradient makes it challenging to go to high temperatures, spinning turbines with steam. Uh, unlike some parts of the U.S. and other parts of the world, of course, and the best, uh, you know, hot volcanic region is right next to Vancouver, and nobody wants to develop anything that might, you know, disrupt uh, the local flora and fauna. So there's there is not much in the way of uh, high temperature geothermal development, but low grade stuff. There's plenty of opportunity around Canada and new movements towards that. Okay, great. What I don't. Yeah, if I could add, um, I don't think that Canada or any country can match what the United States has done as, as a, a policy transition last year with the Inflation Reduction Act, just focusing on carbon sequestration, right? Here is a, there were economic uses for taking carbon out of gas streams and you, know, you could uh, use it for enhanced, enhanced oil recovery, but there was not an economic use to treat it as a waste, something we just have to take out of uh, out of fuels and and uh, other activities um, uh, to um, reduce the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. So the there was since 2008 a tax credit of $35 a ton 
that uh, you could have a, a, under certain circumstances. After the under the but thirty five dollars a ton didn't really cover the cost of of, of uh, capturing and sequestering carbon if you're if you have a, a, no other revenue streams on top of that and even if you do have revenue streams on top of that they're scant uh, so now we have eighty five dollars a ton as a as a federal subsidy in the form of a tax credit that you can sell uh, to anyone who wants to buy it. Uh, if uh, and it goes up to one hundred and eighty five dollars a ton if you're uh, direct air capture, which which would have no economic value other than um, uh, to save the planet. So now um, people can make money uh, doing that up to eighty five dollars, one hundred and eighty five dollars a ton. Now, along the way, there are some strings attached to all these credits that uh, relate to uh, labor practices and, and wage uh, prevailing wage and apprenticeships and and uh, uh, when we move to renewable energy there's the US content that that's part of the strings that are attached that all seem to be sensible US policies I think we're going to see other countries matching these things or complaining that we're too generous now do you what is your thoughts on, I agree with you on how much progress has been made there and that we are leading that. What is your, your opinion on the framework that has yet to be finalized? Just be patient. The, everyone was uh, pleasantly surprised. I think, I think market participants didn't expect uh, everything that was in the uh, inflation reduction package for uh, carbon sequestration. We we have new subsidies for hydrogen, clean hydrogen that didn't exist at all. It's not like they expanded the credit; they made a new credit. Same with um with uh, battery storage, uh, and then this the whole uh, monetization of credits by selling them to third parties rather than having to recruit uh, an investor partner who can monetize the credit is should open up the. Uh, the ability of, of uh, lots of market participants who have small tax positions but still have them to participate. But we we're in a multi-month period where uh, some of the details on how credits can be monetized works and, and some details about what would be qualifying costs and uh, uh, need to be revealed. And um, it's, it's been less than uh, six months here, so um, it'll unfold. Transactions need some time to brew anyway. Would anyone else like to join in on that? Maybe I'll chime in just one more point of clarity on the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's it's specifically hydrogen credits or CO2 injection credits, uh, which I think is, you know, both of those are brilliant. US will be leading the way on both. And even from an enhanced oil recovery pro process, um, you know, this will supercharge sort of the America first energy policy phase next. Uh, I think that that's going to be something that is an under under realized aspect of this, perhaps. Um, even though these re re uh, reservoirs keep about two thirds of the CO2, um, there is still some that comes out and then that can be recaptured and pushed back in. And in most cases, it is. So I, I in in Canada, both frameworks kind of work together. So you have, if you're making hydrogen out of the same zone where you're sequestering CO2, those have separate incentives that are both, you can take them both. In the United States, uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, you have to sort of pick, is this project going to be getting $3 per kilogram for making hydrogen out of this oil field? Or is it gonna be uh, getting up to $185, maybe it's 65, maybe it's 85, it's kind of a graduated thing. Um, for the uh, sequestration aspect. So I think that uh, that's one sort of distinction that yep. if that, it'd be nice if you could do both in the US as well. But anyway, generous anyways. Yeah. Very good point. I guess looking at, um, I guess from my perspective, obviously standing maybe not not sat in uh, in the US or Canada right now, I guess the, the kind of broader aspect to think about this as well is, um, I completely agree with what's been said on the on the IRA, but I think obviously we need to remember that the IRA is probably quite a different mechanism to what exists outside uh, to the rest of the world. Obviously, this is very much incentive driven and is about putting large investment and cash flow 
straight to where it's seen to be needed to develop those technologies at a, a very fast pace. Of course, when we look at, uh, I mean, obviously where I sit in, in, in London, you know, obviously the, the kind of UK or EU approach, there's similar sorts of funding, but I would say that the, I completely agree that the, the pace of the development of those technologies is going to be sort of pushed a little bit more, more by, by also the, the, the need for how it plays a role in, you know, obviously the, the things I cover, the carbon markets, the way in which it can actually help operators or industrial participants reduce their emissions um, or be contributing towards reductions of their emissions. So, of course, in fact, you know, less, I guess, of direct upfront investment. I mean, there are funds through the EU's emissions trading system, the Innovation Fund, for example, which is now a, a fairly long standing, has quite a long history as a, as a fund that goes towards a range of different things, including CCUS technology development. But, uh, but the likes of this and obviously the voluntary carbon market where we obviously uh, price assess uh, S&P um, uh, tech carbon capture credits, which obviously currently around $120, $130 a ton for those credits as well. I think it, it shows the power, I guess, of using or, or, or the, worth, the rest of the world's kind of market-based approach is probably developing at some pace and would obviously have to, you know, the, the money's going to have to come uh, not just straight up front by, by the government, it's going to actually be kind of reinvested by the way in which other businesses are going to be kind of paying for a carbon cost for some time yet to come before we get clarity, at least certainly in uh, the EU and, and where, you know, in, in so far as where those, you know, potential kind of carbon credits that you might gain from those technologies are concerned. That's something that isn't kind of part of the EU framework right now, but there is appetite to build a uh, carbon removal sort of certification framework, for example, which could then place CCUS right at the heart of how Europe and how other economies can actually decarbonize if they kind of use their market-based mechanisms to do that. With the CCS industry and with the ability of storage, which is great, but there's only certain spots in the world that you can store carbon. You can't just poke a well anywhere that you want. So with that being said, in the lack of infrastructure, as much infrastructure as we seem to have, we also lack a lot of infrastructure that can actually be utilized for CO2 and for hydrogen, let alone the power resources that it takes to actually put behind all the compression and liquefaction and processing behind this. So what I'm getting at is with the knowing that there is a set amount of storage out there in which has yet to be granted access to via EPA, at least in the states. What is the time frame, or what are some of the hurdles that you're seeing currently that you're um, hoping to either see progress in the next year, or that you already do see progress in, in being able to get these things permitted and built? And then what about the communities that are disconnected? So transport costs are still gonna be high. They're still years away from getting pipelines that are gonna be beyond 50 miles from the storage sites. So how do you see that working for other companies? Are they still gonna be buying into it via offsets or do you see them being able to do this on a smaller scale as well in the future? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. So on, in the Canadian context, it's actually very similar. So we're having discussions with local uh, provincial governments around um, small scale carbon sequestration. So there is a big multi-billion dollar carbon trunk line in Alberta. And if you're not on it or near it, what do you do? So there's certain programs and incentives uh, for putting stuff into that line and taking it out and sequestering it near that line and future plans for other similar ones. But if you're off somewhere far from that, uh, there, there are some ways to, to access carbon sequestration within the existing framework and get paid for it. And one of them, uh, the, one of the reasons I like the proton approach is because when you when you shrink CO2 as a, as a solid carbonate, its volume is about 12 times less than high pressure liquid CO2 or supercritical CO2. And it's permanently stored because it's rock within the pore space that you're creating. So uh, this will be done, uh, is being done, and will continue to be done at projects in Canada. And I expect very soon also in the US, you don't have to be tied to a, a trunk line if, as long as you have an oil and gas deposit that you can do this uh, carbon uh, carbonate creation process in, then uh, then you're good to go wherever you are. So 
Uh, I think that'll be the, true all across the U.S. as well. What are the elements that go into a carbonate molecule? Uh, there's about 80 different types of carbonate. The most simple is limestone, so calcium carbonate, C CaCO3. Mm -hmm. and there's potassium carbonate, iron carbonates, and many magnesium. So, yeah. And that that uh, one chemical is already in the oil field bottom water. So you have a big uh, chemical soup of ions in non-potable water in the in the associated formation water in an oil field. Although this is the business panel, uh, a topic that uh, is still being researched, probably will be for a while, uh, relates to storage of large volumes of clean hydrogen. I mean, that um, it's, it's known that that can be stored, of course, above ground and in uh, storage containers and pipelines if they're of the, the proper uh, spe specifications and uh, salt dome voids, but, um, but maybe, not, um, maybe not depleted gas wells uh, when we're thinking about hydrogen. It's something still to study. That could be an impediment to the development of that field. I think it depends a little bit on um, what the goal is. So if you're just, if you're making hydrogen cheaper than natural gas and you're not worried about co-mingling it to burn it in big combined cycle turbines, for example, um, then using oil, like basically depleted gas field storage for hydrogen is totally fine mm -hmm. uh, and a good thing to do. If, you, if you're wanting it for a large scale fuel cell uh, use or for making ammonia, then you have to keep it fairly pure. Mm -hmm. Speaking of storage of hydrogen and transport of hydrogen, what is y'all's opinion on the blending of hydrogen in the pipelines? Is that still a viable concept? Is it something that you guys see growth in that's going to be um, readily available in near future or bigger companies starting to back off? Or what are some of the things that you're seeing there? We're it's such early days right now that um the, the only applications that I'm aware of would be on-site storage of the uh, production and storage of the hydrogen. There's, uh, and blending nonetheless with, with, uh, with natural gas that can be delivered to the generating project. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a project that the Department of Energy has uh, announced a big financing for that will uh, have these elements in, in Utah. We have to imagine that we're a decade away from now uh, when there's multiple uh, uh, power plants and other, uh, other um, industrial facilities that would need hydrogen as a fuel when we start thinking about a hydrogen pipeline network. And yes, there's this concept that if a lot of power plants were using blends, we could be blending it in the, in the existing pipelines, the natural gas pipelines, and maybe that's in our future, but in stage one, it'll be more localized hubs where they're sharing, you know, local pipeline networks before we think about blending hydrogen into an interstate pipeline or a local distribution system, something like that. I think maybe I'll chime in a little bit. So they're already doing it in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. Germany, they're do doing it up to 2%. And I think they recently moved it higher in terms of what's allowed. Um, one of the issues they, they've noticed is if they're blending uh, with salt cavern storage, they start to get density stratification. So more hydrogen concentration at the top compared to near the bottom. So they have to pull from two zones and remix it to send it out. And hmm. this is, this, there are different challenges and opportunities with it. Uh, British Columbia is doing it. That there's some, a lot of places that are mandating 15 or 20% as a goal for blending, which is of course easier if you're making hydrogen cheaper than natural gas, you know, just it's a good profitable business to do. Um, the North American context, though, is that you've got 100, I don't know how many regulators that all have to agree on what it will be. So it's such an interconnected gas system that if we push it into the pipeline in Saskatchewan or Edmonton, uh, we don't know if that molecule of hydrogen is going to be in California or Chicago or somewhere else. So it's, it's something that until all of the regulators say, yeah, we're okay with half a percent or we're okay with 
you know, 1%, it'll, it'll, it'll be a long time unless it's just a one way towards a specific cus customer. Um, I don't expect to see much on, on the North American grid unless it's like directly feeding towards only some turbines or steam generators or who, wherever the customer says, yes, I'm okay with it. But that's a one way uh, flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I could uh, just say something to to the U.S. perspective, I, I focus a lot on California, so I'm just kind of aware of all these smaller pilot projects. So maybe a couple of years ago, hydrogen, uh, th there was a lot of talks of hydrogen blending, and uh, you could even go back and look through some <laughs> CPUC filings for uh, studies on, on the impacts of that. Uh, recently, though, what you'll find with LCFS, low carbon fuel standard data, is that renewable natural gas volumes have actually increased and taken a back seat to hydrogen. Now that's for a multitude of reasons, including the LCFS is a little bit more favorable to RNG. Um, <clears throat> so just costs in general, um, and they've gotten the utilities on board, the gas utilities in California on board with those as well. So I think they're working on a 5% blend. There's um, a, a law out there that requires a certain volume by 2025, uh, but at least in California, which is typically viewed as the vanguard of, of energy transition and climate action, they seem to be, at least for now, uh, pushing forward with more of an RNG uh, approach as opposed to hydrogen. So let me add a few comments about um, hydrogen blending. Um, I want to bring the perspective of the materials because we do know that hydrogen causes embrittlement in steels and things like that. And hence, there will be need to uh, really understand the percentage of hydrogen we need to have relative to the kind of materials we're using. So there's a lot of research going into um, the state of the materials. What, what would be the maximum amount of hydrogen we could have before we have some of these issues, operating pressures and temperatures. And I think that when those are clearly defined, it would help us to know if we can really push the limits of, to, to, of hydrogen to what we're currently um, blending. So increase the percentages to some amount that wouldn't allow us to cause embrittlement or any impact on our pipelines and material storage facilities as well. That's all great. Um, I know one of the projects I'm on, a lot of the engineers like to sit and debate the BTU versus the volume when you're adding the hydrogen side and when you're, it's the, um, the value going into a turbine when you're expanding that volume, getting less BTUs and making sure that you have the right blend going in at a, of what Grant was saying, making sure that it's a dynamic blend that it's not being separated and how long of a time can it sit before it does start to separate or what's the distance. Um, what about going into the oil and gas side? You know, there's a lot of groups that are trying to understand their first steps into this market. And sometimes when they hear geothermal, they're thinking, well, we can't just jump in to change our rigs to geothermal. But how do you approach these groups that are trying to take their first steps? What is your position on helping them take the first step and helping them see how to collaborate with some of these lower emission targets and capabilities? Um, and what, you know, what's the first step for them to break into the space, do you think? There's an interesting Canadian company called Ever, and they basically used uh, oil field directional drilling technology that's used uh, in set steam assisted gravity drainage projects where you sort of have a well pair drilled and one of them tracks magnetically the first one. And so you, you drill this pair of wells horizontally. And what these guys have done is basically start that way. And then one well connects to the other well so that you can flow uh, cold water down one pipe into very hot, deep rock, and you don't actually need fluid from that rock. You can actually, within a closed system, bring it back up. So in places where the electricity price is high, like Germany and some other places, 
this has been going on now for a few years. And I think that that will continue to develop in oil and gas drilling technology as its uh, cost and, and, you know, possibility continues to improve. That will continue to have benefits to the geothermal industry, uh, almost one for one. So I've been on giant rigs in Iceland where they're drilling uh, very huge wells, uh, high temperature, um, you know, the, one of the big challenges or differences is you need a huge amount of volume typically with geothermal. So you, you have, you might, your well bore might be the diameter of a garbage can and, uh, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, an oil and gas deposit where the value per unit of volume is much higher with oil, for example. And, um, yeah, geothermal just, it, it takes a lot of volume to, to make a lot of money. And so low cost, huge drilling is, uh, you know, part of that. And I think the U S is actually one of the world leaders in terms of like technology for a very large scale drilling. And I'll, I'll jump in here real quick. If I can, mm. the, this is Joe Petir, uh, from PetroLearn. Sorry, my camera's off. I am, I'm not in a, in a state where I can have my camera on, but, um, just if anybody saw my presentation looking at Wyoming, one of the primary goals of what we were doing was taking the existing data that was already there and trying to understand what resource was both co-located with the oil and gas and the oil and gas industry, and then also what future opportunities there were. So I think that that would be a really great first step is to help oil and gas companies understand what they actually have with their existing oil and gas leases. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have the access to the geothermal. I'm, I'm not a legal expert and I, I'm not going to pretend to be one, but I think if they were to understand what they what resource they have, and where they've already got all of that infrastructure, that is that is almost the what I see as that easy step into the geothermal market. And I'll I'll stop talking there. So I was going to say um, start small, in the sense that it combines what Grant and Joe have said. Um, most of the skills. Most of the expertise, most of the data that resides with the oil and gas industry are very important for the geothermal space. Um, again, I would also, I would reference my own talk where I looked at the kind of skills and competencies we have used in the oil and gas industry and how we have transferred them into um, the geothermal space because of the similarity in the value chain, starting from the point of um, exploration, up onto the point of development through drilling and all of that. We understand the challenges that we see in the geothermal space and how it differs from the oil and gas industry, um, especially having to do with high temperatures and large volumes that are required to generate the same amount of energy or power that would have been done by um, um, fuel like um, oil and gas. But at the same time, what we see is that we can take the learnings, the, um, the way technology has evolved in those spaces has advanced and then apply them that has evolved and advanced in the oil and gas industry and bring them towards the um, geothermal space. Very, um, for instance, drilling of horizontal wells um, really made a huge impact in the oil and gas industry. And so if we bring that kind of technology towards the geothermal space, where most of the wells are vertical is going to help us have more access to the reservoir and extract more heat. Um, the second thing is creating additional pathways for which we could access um, fluids um, or even inject fluids, which we could um, take the experience and learnings from um, you know, things like hydraulic fracturing and the oil and gas industry. So it's more of um, knowledge and technology transfer and the basic understanding that um, all of those things are going to be very important if we want to advance and grow the geothermal space very quickly. One question I get from some of the upstream guys 
is when they're looking at geothermal as an application for whether it's um, an old pad well site you know, or something that's on the newer side and trying to utilize it for a combined cycle for power. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions is what happens if they don't want to use the power and they need to turn it off? And what then, how do we store it? Which I think this is a good topic for now bringing in hydrogen with the geothermal space as well as possibly the CO2 from the geothermal space and what we can utilize it and how to not deplete the heat and what kind of scale we need to optimize that. And so is that you know, something that is easily manageable in conversation with these upstream partners to be able to tell them and help them understand the ways that you can utilize geothermal for both storage, not depleting the asset and utilization for power? So Geotherma has, um, Geotherma Energy has a broad range of applications. We, we speak a lot about the power aspect, but there's the direct use, there is use for agriculture, there's combination with, you know, several aspects of the evolving energy mix. So um, I like to think of Geotherma as a very versatile, um, versatile energy resource can be hybrid, can be run in hybrid with um, other energy resources. Now, there might be the issue of how do I stop my production when I, when I don't want it, when I don't want to um, produce energy. Um, and this is something that is currently being looked into. Depending on your source and the kind of power plant that you have, you may not always be able to just turn off your production and stop your um, power plant. But if you're going to be using geothermal energy for things like direct use, heating of homes, heating of um, buildings, that is much easier to manipulate. So it will most, most likely depend on how we position the use. Um, heating of homes could either be done through a plant, you know, from the grid or through the, um, you know, direct use or home heating. So just depending on how we use the geothermal energy would depend on how we could um, put turn it on and turn it off, if I would say. And I'll I'll add in another thought that typically with a scale traditional geothermal power plants, right now, if they do need to shut off the, the power production, there's typically a bypass. So that way, your wells can keep flowing, but you just move the water and just re-inject it. So you're not depleting the heat and you're able to keep everything moving and keep the system operating. It's just the turbine and the actual power generation that gets shut off. So that's something that is one of these relatively simple engineering fixes that I'm sure would, would be able to be figured out as we're talking about converting oil and gas wells or looking at hybrid systems, bringing in multiple different types of energy. And what about the water use for the geothermal, Joe? As I know some people have been asking, you know, how much water is needed for these geothermal wells? Is that gonna be an issue on the emissions or mitigating the waste streams the correct way? Yeah, I think that water is, it, it is definitely a, a hot topic right now and the amount of water use. A lot of systems nowadays, the, the binary geothermal systems, they can operate at lower temperature. And because they're a binary, what you have going on is the water you're producing you're, you're pumping all of that water back into the ground. And then it really just depends on your cooling system. And many of these, because of water restrictions, are in utilized in an air-cooled system. So just the, the big fans that you're used to, similar to your, your air conditioning system, where there's no actual water being run, it's just a fan. And in areas where water is an issue, it may be that, that the binary systems end up taking precedent 
And that is how we generate electricity, which I think is a, is a very elegant solution to, to this problem where we can get, get a high quality base load, reliable power and still not have the same issues with, with, um, with water usage. Great answer. I like the elegant solution. Works well. Anyone else like to add to that? Going one more thing into the geothermal side, how do you see utilities in their opinion on large scale geothermal is in the near term, is it something that they feel is going to be valuable to how they can grow their business, especially with, cause they, on the business side, on utilities, they make money in a lot, in a different way, but, or is geothermal really more on the value set of helping utilities keep their base load and focus on the big cities versus the geothermal being able to take care of some of the remote or strategic microgrid systems. Does anybody else want to take a stab at that first? I just wanted to comment a bit on um, what I see or what I what I perceive would happen in the future, but we don't know, right? Because um, I don't have a crystal ball. But the thing is, um, there's going to be huge demand for energy as we begin to think about um, things like hydrogen economy, um, carbon capture and storage and things like that. All of these processes have huge energy demand. And we would be asking ourselves, where are we going to get the energy for compression? Where's the energy for you know, transportation and things like that? And I foresee the need for things like geothermal energy that does not have high um, emissions in terms of CO2 or greenhouse gases, playing a, a bigger role in supporting all of these economies. Um, quite recently, um, ahead of the direct air capture that's gonna be combined with geothermal energy to ensure there's sufficient energy to move that space. So the utilities will be seeing more demand in the future as we begin to you know, pursue and drive and implement strategies for low carbon um, technologies in, in, in the grid and things like that. Um, so Joe, I can, that was what I wanted to say, if you wanted to. Maybe I'll, I'll just push out an idea quick about uh, low grade versus high grade. I think most utilities don't really want to dabble in low grade uh, heat. So, but there are a lot of in, end users that do. So if you have a food processing plant and you're, you know, sterilizing cans or you're making beer or you're doing lots of different things, or you maybe have a giant swimming pool that you need to heat in a Northern climate. There, there are many low grade heat uses that totally make sense. Uh, even preheating boiler feed water for a steam generator, or you know, there's a lot of those um, specific use cases, but for, Utility scale, low grade heat, that's a, that's a tougher one um, in terms of the economics compared to what else is out there. Not impossible, and I guess it's regionally um, relevant. What is the prevailing electricity price as well? Anyway, just my two cents. I think I'll just echo those thoughts that one of the, what I see is probably one of the the harder challenges for utilities is the upfront capital and the risk associated with that early stage exploration and development. I think that there, there, there are projects that we have looked at that really the biggest benefit is for the utilities. So it would only make sense that the utility is the one actually investing in it. But because of the risk, it is it is still a a big question mark for them. So I see utilities having a pivotal role. I don't know. I I think it may be as a as a kind of seed funding round and and coming in at the end to to fully finance a project. But I think that the most important part is that there is significant value both 
what what Grant was pointing out with the low grade heat, and then also just the the base load electricity where you have those opportunities. It is it is vitally important for utilities to see that value and understand that value. And I think that's kind of where they are right now. And once they understand the value, then we can start seeing the almost the cooperation and the investment into geothermal. And how about the use of geothermal to make hydrogen? Well, one of the problems of um, producing green hydrogen, right? The hydrogen that has no carbon being released when you produce it, um, is that if you were relying on wind and solar resources, your hydrogen production will operate at a capacity factor similar to what is driving the wind and solar. So when the sun goes down, you don't have any solar energy to uh, use uh, through your electrolyzers to make uh, green hydrogen when the wind isn't blowing or it is blowing, but not as strongly, right? You have these variations in the in the capacity factor, which is one of the people estimate the cost of green hydrogen, even when it's at scale, it, it, it's dragged down by the fact that your utilization rate, if you're relying on wind and solar, is going to be 50% if you're, at best, if you're in a place that has good radiance and good wind. If you have other non uh, uh, carbon producing sources like hydro or geothermal, and you can, that are firm, uh, geothermal can be firm, right? You can be operating it constantly. Then that will improve over time, that will improve the cost of producing the, the uh, green hydrogen. And, you know, thinking about the commercial issues of of, uh, of, of storage, right? Or the, earlier in this conversation, people were talking about what you would do when you have you have a uh, geothermal resource that can run all the time, but it may not be economic to be selling your electricity at certain times. Well, if you're producing hydrogen, which itself could be stored, green hydrogen, it can be moved or or or, or put through the power plant later on, uh, so that um, you're producing power when the price is highest. Um, it can improve, uh, you know, the the efficiencies and the economics of the project all around. Would anyone else like to chime in on that? I would just say I I agree with that. That's kind of those are the kind of questions that that need to be asked when it comes to the geothermal with hydrogen and when you start looking at at larger even not just the the economic side of when you've got the power sales price too too low to be economic to produce the geothermal but also yep. in areas where you've got a, a 15 say 15 megawatt power source resource there that would supply a, a town of say five megawatts and there you've got this significant resource larger than what you need. Is there a way to build at scale and and commercialize that extra those extra megawatts? It's a it's a challenging it's a challenging question, but I think hydrogen is one of those opportunities to make more value from geothermal. That's right. As a general statement, blanket statement about electrolysis, which is probably how the geothermal to hydrogen would happen. Uh, a lot of people don't think about the oxygen. So you're making for each kilogram of or each pound of oxygen, you're making eight pounds of, uh, sorry, of, of hydrogen. You're making eight pounds of hydrogen, oxygen, <laughs> sorry. So, um, you know, th this is a huge amount of pure oxygen and pure oxygen can also have very useful um, things in energy in terms of like with your, you know, waste to heat or, um, inject it like we're doing into old oil and gas deposits. So um, yeah, just considering that as part of the framework for whenever you're doing electrolysis, what are we gonna make use of with this oxygen is, is probably a question that is not asked enough. Right. So I see um, geothermal in, the, um, in this process of making hydrogen 
more towards complementing solar and wind because the challenge we see with solar and wind is the intermittency and we want to generate hydrogen so that we could you know we have something to fall back on when those resources are not available so my view is if we do have geothermal energy which doesn't have an issue in um, releasing co2 or greenhouse gas emissions the um, you know in general then i might as well use my geothermal energy directly in my grid but then if i have to convert solar and wind to hydrogen which is energy intensive in itself, then perhaps I may want to draw from, you know, geothermal as well, if I have it available to be able to do that. So um, I think we also need to think of the fact that conventional geothermal energy is not everywhere. For now, we are still trying to advance it to make it geothermal everywhere and, you know, as much as possible. So it's not everywhere we might see the use of geothermal energy for hydrogen. But I think it will be more useful in the conversion processes, trying to reduce the energy requirements um, rather than having to use it to just generate hydrogen um, from energy utilization point of view. And uh, just last, Thing I'll note on, on this is that, I mean, certainly look for the Treasury Department's uh, guidance. I know that they uh, collected comments. Uh, I think they received a, a, like over 200 or something on, um, you know, implementing the, the hydrogen emissions measurements and life, um, life cycle emissions. There's no uh, release date, specific release date expected. Um, as far as I know, I think sometime in this year, we'll, we'll see the the draft proposal get released, but certainly look out to the IRS for all these for further guidance on all these tax credit issues that we've been alluding to throughout this panel. That's right. That would be very critical for the, especially for the blue hydrogen production. In, in as much as the what 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 will be measured is in terms of life cycle um, uh, carbon being released as a ratio. Thanks for sharing. Yes, I think we're all waiting for that framework to be released so that we can move forward with some of these contracts. That's for sure. Going into, you know, Grant, you brought up a great point with it's what are the other off takes? What other things can you do with all of this? I think that's one of the most important things. And one thing I saw a lot of during COVID was pure collaboration among industries. All industries were talking, nobody had hate towards the other. It was simply, we were all in a bad state and we needed to get out of it, right? And there was no fingers to point. It wasn't wind or oil fault, it was COVID's fault. So that made it nice for once. But I do think that some of that collaboration has changed. You got some of the bigger players coming in, kind of making their path through everything. But um, looking at it that way, you know, what are some of the other commodities that you see or other ways that people can get involved with geothermal or CCS or, or hydrogen? Is there other small businesses that people haven't thought about? Or, you know, how do we bring up that narrative to bring more collaboration? Maybe I'll start. So I, I think any place you have a large uh, production of hydrogen, there's going to be a significant number of off takers that just show up as part of the ecosystem. So if you're doing, assume you're going to do a thousand tons a day and put that through a combined cycle turbine, make a gigawatt of electricity onto the power grid or something. Instead of making a thousand tons a day, maybe you make 1200 tons a day and then the tire recycling company takes five tons and the, the you know, somebody is trying to make biofuels or aviate synthetic jet fuel, they come and do some. The microbial protein company comes and takes some of the hydrogen. Um, there's kind of like a, I think an ecosystem that will form around all of the large scale things when it happens, including cascading heat systems. So one of the most interesting ones I've ever seen was in Germany at Erdinger, where they had the, named after the beer and the town. Uh, they have this, basically it, um, they have geothermal, 
electricity production, and then they have a cascading heat system, so the, the big brewery, and then the final thing is this massive aquatic park, this German thermal bath. So I think there's going to be an, an more movement towards uh, cascading energy systems and new uh, ecology of companies that sort of show up where there's a large uh, low cost hydrogen supply. And that hydrogen supply will often usually be coincident with carbon sequestration at the exact same project because CO2 can be turned into carbonate, but that reaction releases additional hydrogen. So you've got pipes coming in for CO2 maybe, and you've got pipes coming out of hydrogen, but a lot of local use too. So one of my main projects in um, the Northeast is a large scale CCS development. And it's not the typical working with ethanol plants and getting the same type of CO2. Um, with some of these industrial hubs, it's, you know, you make a really good point with this cascading, right? Making sure that things are also thriving. With CCS, there's not always a lot of side hustles, if you want to say that. But there is a utilization that's absolutely needed. And so one of the uh, concepts I've kept closely is that, you know, whoever can't capture their CO2, because there's quite a lot, lot that have a lot of emissions, but they can't capture it, it's just not economic, or it's not the, the most lovely stream to capture. And so that's again, where hydrogen can co-mingle, which I see Europe doing a great job of keeping hydrogen and CO2 co-located. You see all their pipelines together, it's all in parallel. They're giving people the option to, to jump in on either side. And I'm not seeing that as much here in the States, I, and I'd like to, um, because I think it's that, you know, how do you create this cascading effect for lowering your emissions and making sure there's a business proposition for people in those clusters to create an actual bridge of hubs. Um, but what is your thoughts on utilization and other businesses coming off of these CCS projects? Um, because a lot of, people are forgetting the utilization of carbon and what it's needed for it. And the irony of that we go to many carbon shortages in the world. So let I, me talk about, oh, Grant, you wanna speak? No, go ahead. Mm. Thanks, Rita. So um, I wanna comment on the use of um, CO2 as an alternative walking fluid as we develop um, enhanced geothermal systems or even what we call the CO2 plume geothermal. So we found that, that um, CO2 has some favorable properties and especially um, less power requirements are needed compared to water if we want to use CO2 as a working fluid. It comes with its challenges of you know, what we'll see, CO2 has reactions, but if it's a cycle that keeps moving, then it's likely that we can use CO2 to extract heat from the subsurface, use it to generate electricity. So that's um, one of the ways, either through the enhanced geothermal systems or using it through um, sedimentary reservoirs, and we have the CO2 plume geothermal. If we are able to make this work, understand the kind of subsurface properties that would enable that, um, the advances we see with binary power plants and organic rank and cycles that um, we don't necessarily have to let the CO2 get back into the atmosphere. If we're able to get all those things working, then we would have utilize um, uses of CO2, uh, which would be collaborate, a collaboration between geothermal industry and the CC as part of things. And, um, you know, just making, making both work for all our benefits. Well, first I'll say that's that's brilliantly insightful. And I, very, I know very few people who are thinking about CO2 as a geothermal working fluid, but you're right. You can actually, it's in the, um, the phase diagram suggests that it can be something that can geyser up and spin turbines, and then you send it back down and, and get the benefit again. So I, I'm, congratulations on that. Uh, noticing that. I think it's actually going to be big on Mars someday as well, because the atmosphere is 96% CO2. But uh, for now, somebody should be prototyping it here, and I think it'll work well here as well. If you're separating out some amount of uh, food-grade CO2, you know, as part of the 
uh, distillation process. So I guess um, if, you, if you have a cryogenic air separation unit, you get the oxygen out. And now to pressurize it, to get it in the ground, you need to warm it up. One of the things you can heat exchange it with is a produced gas stream that uh, if you're injecting oxygen into the system, it's producing some methane, so some CO2 and some hydrogen. So if you do passive heat exchange, you can have LNG, you can have food grade CO2 and separate vessels of things that you can sell. So some of that CO2 will get used in urea or methanol production. Some of it will be sold to the, well, the, the agriculture industry. They actually use it as part of the process for euthanizing uh, livestock. And then of course, food packaging, it's very common. So there's going to be um, some use for it, but I think the big one is gonna be turning it into carbonate, which releases additional hydrogen. So that's a very uh, enormous way to utilize it is trigger these reactions that are hydrogen productive, so. All right, going into some of the last questions. One of the last questions is, you know, as exciting as all of this is, and there's a lot of smart people on, on here that we understand you know, what the value is, but the other hurdle is the population that's outside of the industry, that is outside of understanding energy. There's a lot of people in energy that don't understand the midstream and downstream and vice versa. Um, how do how do you see the best path forward in the near term to help with the infrastructure that's needed for these projects for CCS hydrogen geothermal you name it uh, when you've got you know as much as it's the terms that you use educating the public um, I know some of the CO2 pipelines are getting some headaches as well as looking at hydrogen pipelines and then looking at it as a gas and now you know is it oil and gas so you, you know how are you going to get through the liability and the risk and all that so do you guys see that the U.S. will continue to aggressively move forward with the infrastructure to make these projects happen to help us decarbonize or do you also see some major obstacles coming up um, and how do we address those? Well, uh, maybe I'll go first. I, I don't see obstacles. You know, if there's, uh, if you're, th if you're getting $3 a kilogram on hydrogen produced below a certain threshold of carbon intensity, um, a thousand tons a day hydrogen is roughly what's needed for a gigawatt of electricity through a combined cycle turbine. So if you're, if you're doing that, then additionally, on top of those project economics, which are already robust, you get a billion dollars per year in, in tax credits, you know, and that you can sell to someone else. I think it's it's going to be um, no problem finding takers. And this this whole thing, when people realize how much money is being made, uh, you know, what's a, a pipeline is no big deal. That's my personal view. Yeah, so I, I agree that um, the, the government's policies are going to stimulate investment in, in uh, CCS and in uh, in hydrogen, both blue and green. When we think about public opposition to infrastructure that's linked to, to all this, there still will be um, resistance to, um, uh, to the blue hydrogen, right? And to the CCS because uh, to some extent, because there, there's a, uh, the stakeholders who um, have a more absolutist view on, on how to uh, decarbonize, will see that these are uh, activities that prolong um, investment in, in uh, gas production, right? It's the feedstock for the blue hydrogen uh, and, uh, and is really the fuel after decarbonization for other activities. So there's probably some public relations that still needs to go. We still, uh, uh, I, I, I read an article in the New York Times about uh, a month ago of, about a project for it was a blue hydrogen project and the the writer uh, made note that Blackstone was behind the project and that Schwartzman is a donor to Trump and nowhere and that uh, green hydrogen is much cheaper or no 
is much less carbon. Nowhere in the article did it talk about how blue hydrogen is a, a third the cost of, of green right now. There, there was an absence of that, of that uh, consideration. So there's some, uh, some PR left to be done here. I do think that ESG, as much as some people love that term and some people hate it, is a good way to help change that narrative publicly and getting communities involved in these projects to help understand what the impact is overall and getting to understand, you know, one of my favorite conversations I've ever had was a two week conversation that um, I didn't ever say the word pipeline all I said was infrastructure and transport line and how many trucks that would take off the road in a neighborhood. And when you explain that it's a line that goes underneath and you don't realize that it can be small and it doesn't always have to be above ground and a bus could fit through it. You know, it's, I think it's a lot of the narrative that needs to be in these communities as we develop these projects, as we hit the public. Um, in a parallel movement. Would you agree? Yes, yeah. I mean, I think it's a it's a complex issue. It, it uh, we don't have to hate ESG. That's a good thing. Uh, but um, the public needs to know the dollars and cents a little bit more than they than they do. Okay. And they need to know more about the the shortcomings of wind and solar, the intermittency issue that has to be solved with some firm sources of power. Ideally, that if you have lots of hydro and adequate geothermal, and uh, if if you'll tolerate nuclear, those are all nice firm sources that um, don't give off carbon. But Mother Nature didn't put those places, those kinds of resources everywhere, and um, some capacity to take uh, fossil fuels and decarbonize them so that we can fill in where uh, where uh, variable renewable energy is missing is is going to be part of the story and it's not that hard to understand but it the story needs to be told more than it is very much agree there is there anything you guys want to bring up on the levelized cost of co2 hydrogen or power or um, where you see that market going what it needs um, currently Yeah, I, I guess I'll just comment. So in terms of levelized cost, and I alluded to it briefly with um, electrolysis, can you monetize the, the oxygen? So what is the levelized cost of hydrogen if there's a multi-product multi revenue stream? So actually I was on Joe Batir's podcast a little while ago talking about if you have these other revenue streams from air separation, you get nitrogen, you get you know these different other revenue streams that might mean that the price of hydrogen is completely irrelevant. You could vent 100% of it to atmosphere and it's still a profitable business based on the other revenue streams. So the process is like clear hydrogen where you can have massive carbon sequestration so you can get the carbon intensity far lower than zero by life cycle analysis. You know, that there's these, yeah, I guess additional revenue streams that mean the the cost of hydrogen is going way, way down further than most people are believing who are mostly talking about blue and green instead of clear hydrogen. What, what I want to um, comment about is how um, the Inflation Reduction Act has really helped with um, levelized cost of, um, you know, things related to both hydrogen and CC, CCS, and the fact that many years ago, when we think about CCS, it was something that was very expensive, but the kind of policies and incentives that have been put in place is trying to drive down this cost. And um, if we still get more of that, we may get to the point where, um, where CCS isn't as expensive as it is. We hope that those kind of things are going to help CCS scale. And by the time we begin to combine carbon capture sequestration with different aspects of the energy sector, 
be it power plants, be it industries, ETC, then we will get to that point where it's something that is either generating some sort of revenue for people or it's something that the cost is something that is bearable. So um, I think there's yeah. um, it's good to see how things are just prog progressing over the years due to policies and incentives in place. Michael or Matt, do you have anything else to add on cost? The only thing I guess I'd <clears throat> I'd add is I think on maybe not speaking directly to to just the US perspective, but I guess it's it's something for the US, you know, from a government level to think about, which is when you kind of compare other approaches that are going on globally to to deal with the levelized cost of energy. A lot of, as I say, a lot of the things we talked about earlier, you know markets and carbon prices and things that help you know really try and level that 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 playing field to some extent are largely considered sort of sticks in in this world you know they're they're not the incentives that we're seeing being put forward in the us and so the question of course is how far does the incentives that the ira will you know put forward go towards getting us to a levelized cost of energy and whether that's something that you know, will it be ultimately successful? And I obviously everybody hopes it it, it is. But of course, uh, certainly if lessons are to be learned from from other um, other approaches, and if there's kind of other things that policymakers have at their disposal, we obviously have a a range of you know ways in which you try and incentivize the um, the playing field another way, which is by obviously putting that kind of higher carbon price, that carbon cost on. The, the the no you know the fossil fuel generation that currently goes on i mean in the Euro in european uh emissions trading system you saw the a kind of record in the last couple of weeks 100 euros per ton of co2 under the regulated market there you know that in itself is enough um to certainly help incentivize kind of initial coal to gas switching within the eu market just off just off the back of the carbon price alone so it's showing playing a, a role there but of course, it uh, it arguably needs to obviously go further in terms of using that revenue to help push those renewable incentives. Obviously, the EU have kind of gone a bit further themselves in recent uh, in recent months following the, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where of course we now have additional complementary policies like Repower EU, which is going to be really accelerating renewable development, mm -hmm. renewable technology in 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 Europe. But, um, but it shows, I guess, the mix that's available to policymakers here. You know, it's not just maybe you're necessarily all about incentives getting us there. We might need to think about putting some, you know, dare I say it, put some, put some, uh, you know, sticks as well as some carrots on the on the table. That might be. Uh, it's just hard to get Congress to um, to approve sticks, isn't it? And uh, yeah, indeed. I'm not kidding. <laughs> courts, the courts will peel them off and. And we are an energy producing country with with great resource fossil fuel resources so finding a way to motivate people to make money by taking the carbon out is probably um obviously going to succeed more has so far as far as getting approved and probably if we look at prior examples in the marketplace of how incentives around renewable energy has motivated the that industry to scale up to a place where the the levelized cost of energy from those sources have come down. In principle, the same thing should be happening, uh, not just here, but globally, right? With um, with uh, the the cost of producing uh, blue or green hydrogen. I can't, uh, Kerry, remind, uh, not Kerry, but remind me what, what clear hydrogen is? Uh, clear hydrogen is anything made at a carbon intensity that's lower than zero by life cycle analysis and okay. doesn't need fresh water to be made. Okay. So it's a bigger use. The most uh, uh, obvious example is uh, proton. I would I would like to jump in with just one comment on on this part. That's something that Grant and Proton pointed out on the podcast. Something that I've got other people talking about, and and really just in general, the way that we should be looking at decarbonization and net zero ultimately is a multi-pronged approach. And from my perspective and everything that I've seen, it, when it comes to something like geothermal, it is 
it is the projects that have a heat a heat demand that they can sell to and an electricity demand that they can sell to because then they have two income streams and that ultimately is not an lcoe per se but it is an overall value of the project and i think that 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 really ends up being important to to making all of these all of these systems work is finding ways to monetize not just your your primary income source but being able to monetize everything that you are producing out of the ground and, and i think that's why you see so much funding going into direct lithium extraction right now and why you see things like co2 geothermal because we're trying to find ways to build something that isn't just electricity or isn't just hydrogen production. It's trying to find ways to really make a valued energy ecosystem. Great points there, Joe. Anyone else or some last comments or questions that you have yourself? Don't be shy. So I know you brought up that comment of um, awareness. We have the issues of public perception um what 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 is clean what is not clean and um we have a, a whole upcoming generation that don't really understand life cycle assessments the kind of emissions we see all around and um we speak of fossil fuel as bad dirty etc so i feel that there's need for additional awareness on how different energy you know energy resources will play a role, what are the advantages and disadvantages. And um, in schools, especially the elementary elementary schools, I don't think they should be teaching um, children that one energy is bad, source of energy is bad over another. I think they should just let them know what each of them are, what, what they bring to the table, and let these children explore, find out what they need to know, you know, as they grow older. Because right now they form a perception and anything fossil fuel is bad. They don't see the other uses of fossil fuel. They don't see how fossil fuel has really helped in industrialization over the years. And they don't really want to accept that things like CCS can help to decarbonize industries. So um, I just feel that we need to do a lot of work in awareness and you know, changing public perception all around. Great points, Reed. I wanna chime in and, and agree with Rita there and just also comment that it really is a, in order to get to net zero, we are gonna need everything and we're going to need to be looking at everything from a, from a holistic ecosystem approach. So I just, I realize I don't know if anybody from Carbon Expo is on here, but I do want to thank them for putting on the this virtual event and for inviting all of us to talk. And ultimately, just I just want to be positive towards collaboration and pro collaboration because ultimately that is that is how we're going to develop these full energy ecosystems that can provide real value not just necessarily chasing to the bottom, whatever that lowest LCOE is and whatever we think is the solution, because ultimately I, I think, because we're all here, I think it, there is really no silver bullet. It's gonna take all of us in order to, in order to seek a, a net zero future.
Well said. It's like Captain Planet, your powers combined. So we're all working against air pollution. We're trying to build a better, less intrusive and more ecologically sensitive energy future for coming generations. So yeah, good. Well said, Joe. I won't forget the Captain Planet one. That was great. <laughs> but it is true, and I think uh, we can keep this energy mix going. And as much as we talk about it, it's I hope we can all see more true impact in education, bringing kids, students out to these locations, be part of the developments. Um, I see it all the time in my son's schools, but I always, I love sitting back and asking them questions about, you know, where does the power come behind the light switch or, you know, what is a rig to you guys or what's pipeline? And it's amazing the different answers that I get. Um, but I think it's as simple as those conversations to keep raising the awareness and helping them kind of, I don't like to say desensitize to the energy spectrum, but to really start relaxing when they hear energy and oil and gas and the different types of energies. Uh, but I think it's a very pivotal and exciting time and it's an honor to meet all of you as part of the pivotal time. It's, um, I think all of you are making a huge impact whether you know it or not. there's any closing remarks by y'all, um, please go ahead. I believe we're coming to the 2.30 mark. Also, thank you, Laura, for doing such a great job with the moderating. Just sorry about my voice, <laughs> but thank you, Joe. It's great to see you on here. Thank you, Laura, and um, it was an insightful set of um, panelists. I learned a lot from their comments, their feedback as well, so. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to learning more from you guys. Oh, you're muted. Just saying, uh, also expressing uh, gratitude that you put this nice panel together. And um, I think I learned a lot too from the uh, comments of the other panelists. Yeah, thanks everybody. It was a nice way to end the week as well. And thanks a lot. Good, good topics to explore. Well, Grant and Joe, I'll go ahead and give uh, a thank you to these two. I met them right when I was getting into the renewable space, and they taught me a lot of what I know today about geothermal and inspired me to keep learning. So it's really cool to see you guys on here together. And uh, Leslie, thank you for putting this together and uh, asking me to come in. Yeah. Absolutely, I'm so glad you could make it. Sounds like everything was, it was a big hit over here. So I'm so, so, so glad to have you. Anytime. You guys have a great weekend and I guess we'll see you all in the virtual happy hour here here soon. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye, y'all. Thanks. Thanks.